Most of the time, you watch a fight in MMA and things follow a bit of a pattern. The two combatants can't help but earn respect for each other after a hard-fought bout. Other times though, by the way of bad decision or unexpected circumstance, fighters get angry. Really angry. <laughs> I'm Jason from MMA on Point, and this is called the Top 10 Post-Fight Meltdowns in MMA. Number 10, Brock Lesnar vs. Frank Mir. This is definitely one of the most infamous on the list, partly because it was seen during UFC 100, which was the largest selling UFC pay-per-view ever to that point, a record that stood all the way until McGregor vs. Diaz came around nearly seven years later, the other part being because it was Brock Lesnar. Like him or not, the guy is just a big bastard, and that means A, steroids work, and B, lots and lots of money. So you would think him freaking out came as a result of a loss, but no, he was actually just still that pissed off despite winning. After ground and pounding Frank Mir into the mat, he proceeded to rampage around the ring and promptly get into the face of a still recovering Mir to yell at him over some of the pre-fight verbal jabs. He was then separated by the state commission, so a second fight, or rather assault at this point, wouldn't happen. To which he responded by pushing the state officials demanding space to cool down, and it was during his post-fight interview that he probably got into the most trouble because he accused the UFC's then official beer sponsor Bud Light of underpaying him. I'm gonna drink a Coors Light. That's a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing. He promptly apologized during the press conference after. Number 9, Gray Maynard vs. Rob Emerson Season 5 of The Ultimate Fighter had some real greats, Nate Diaz, Joe Lozon, Andy Wang, and of course, Gray Maynard. You might also remember Rob Emerson who fought him during the finale of that season. And this fight had one of the most memorable knockouts in UFC history. Maynard didn't knock out Emerson though, he knocked out himself. Even still though, Emerson tapped out writhing in pain, not realizing Maynard was out cold. As a result, the fight was ruled a no contest. Bafflingly though, Gray disagreed. But you were unconscious. You knocked yourself out in the I takedown. Look at, look, bro, look at the replay. You picked him up, watch the dump, bang. You hit your head down, now watch this, you're out. Watch He's this. He's done right he, now. He is done, but so are you. You're unconscious. Look at you roll over. You're completely unconscious. As a general rule, Joe Rogan doesn't interview fighters anymore after a knockout loss, along with another example. And I clearly felt a tap. This is a perfect reason why. Hilarious that even though Gray's face ended up in Emerson's crotch, he still insisted he was just resting and fully conscious. Number 8, Tito Ortiz vs. Guy Medzger 2 The first match between Tito and Guy was a controversial one to say the least. Basically, Tito was kneeing Guy Metzger into oblivion in their first fight, and for whatever reason, Big John McCarthy thought that in the midst of it, it would be a good idea to check Metzger's cuts with a ringside physician. Meanwhile, the broadcast announcers thought Metzger tapped. Since McCarthy just stopped the action to check the cut, which was fine, he reset the fight not on the ground, in which Medzger was getting badly damaged, but rather on the feet. So naturally, being a wrestler, Tito went for the takedown again, but was immediately caught in a guillotine and submitted. Very controversial indeed. So when they fought again, a considerable rivalry had built up between the two that extended to Guy's training camp, the Ken Shamrock-led team, the Lion's Den. This time, Tito won relatively easily and without issue dominating Medzger for the whole fight and even taunting Medzger while earning a stoppage win. Moment Months later, we found out how confident Tito was, though, when he put on a shirt saying gay Metzger was his bitch. You are yo, too. Yo, yo. With Shamrock in his corner and his head coach, Ken was absolutely furious. The two started a shouting match that included middle fingers on both hands directed at Ken, and just like that, one of the most infamous rivalries in the sport began. Number seven, Andy Wang. Andy Wang, they don't say, oh, he's a punk. He's all, they say, hey man, this is a warrior. And he was also in the same Ultimate Fighter season as Gray Maynard, Nate Diaz, and Joe Lozon, as mentioned earlier. But he's a lot different from anyone else on this list. Usually a meltdown would mean something of the anger or violent variety, but there's little doubt that this would be an emotional meltdown. After losing his first fight on the show, Wang reacted in surprising fashion. It was so strange and dramatic that even Wang's coach, BJ Penn himself, was thrown off. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Number six, Michael Bisbing versus Jorge Rivera. This is a perfect example of how sometimes animosity over taunting and clowning doesn't end after a fight. Before their fight, Jorge Rivera made a series of videos making fun of Michael Bisbing and going after him. Hey, you ever met my friend Bisbing? He's the biggest dick in the whole wide world. He's a mean old They're all kind of cheesy and not super mean spirited, but either way, Bisbing didn't take it lightly at all. 
And soon we all found that out. And this all put a lot of attention on their fight. And it was going fine, fairly back and forth, until Bisbing quote unquote accidentally hit Rivera with a huge knee illegally while he was on his knees. And this was definitely not the first time Bisbing had made this mistake. You figure he'd know better by now. Rogan and Goldberg said everything but intentional on the broadcast. Credit to Rivera though, he decided to continue on, even though he likely had a concussion from the blow and could have won by DQ if he decided not to continue. Following the restart of the fight, the competitiveness was virtually sucked out of the fight and Bisbing began to dominate and quickly got a TKO stoppage in the second round. You figured this would make for an apologetic Bisbing following the fight, but it was the exact opposite. Going over to Jorge's corner and spitting on them, even went back to Jorge to talk more shit afterwards. Bisbing gave a sorry not sorry apology in the post fight interview that wasn't enough for many, and the whole MMA community at the time nearly had the same reaction. I think that the knee was intentional, and I think he absolutely meant to spit on that guy. Number five, Fabricio Verdum versus Travis Brown 2. The rivalry between these two wasn't particularly high before their bout, and since Verdum had already beaten Brown who was coming off some losses, there wasn't a ton of hype going into this fight. But in between rounds, there was a lot of seemingly wild desperation coming from perhaps the least popular MMA coach in history, Edmund Tarverdian. <laughs> And yes, that's the same coach who told the world that Brown's wife, Ronda Rousey, had Olympic level boxing. I'll be honest, we get boxing world champions in here, girls, she drops all of them with body shots. Holly is not going to try to box with us. I wish she does box with us. She does things in the gym that I've never seen in my life. She's knocking out the guys. Nevertheless, the repeated desperate attempts by coach Edmund actually caused him to lose his voice in between rounds. When he tries to go down, get ready for me. Travis, first with the jab, double jab, chest jab, and then you can do whatever you want. It was so intense, in fact, that after the fight, and probably what was the biggest what the f moment of the year, which was actually the same night that CM Punk fought for the first time, tells you how crazy it is, Edmund actually confronted Verdum in a manner that was apparently threatening enough that he felt the need to retaliate with a kick. This almost incited a brawl in the ring between both camps, but the whole thing ended up getting broken up. Number four, Kazushi Sakuraba versus Conan Silvera. This fight is so far back that even just routine situations like this confused UFC officials, in this case Big John McCarthy. It was also the UFC's first event in Japan before Sakuraba, who was still then only known as a pro wrestler, had even fought in pride. Super early in the fight, Conan was throwing a combination at Sakuraba who dropped down to grab a single leg on Silvera, but from McCarthy's then inexperienced vantage point, it appeared that some of Conan's shots actually landed heavily enough that Sakuraba was knocked out rather than going for the takedown. So Big John called off the fight. And despite Sakuraba's spirited attempts to convince McCarthy that he was fine, the fight was ruled as a KO, not a TKO. He actually thought he was out. So justifiably, Sakuraba refused to accept the ruling and protested in the ring for several minutes, even trying to take Bruce Buffer's mic away to further voice his anger. The crowd also joined in with a chorus of boos. And while Sakuraba was still protesting in the ring, Big John finally saw a replay of what happened and changed the ruling of the fight to a no contest. Those are the good old days. I wish they could do stuff like that now. The fight was then rebooked again for later in the same night where Sakuraba easily won by armbar in the first round. Number three, Paul Daly versus Josh Koscheck. It's hard to think of a more well-known case of someone freaking out after a fight. And this one had a considerable amount of hype as both fighters talked a ton of trash going into this fight. It ended up being a typical Koscheck performance at the time because he was essentially dominating the fight on the ground against the knockout artist that was Paul Daly. And it's not just what happened in the post fight that was controversial. Koscheck faked an injury from what was later found Found out to be a missed illegal knee by Daly to try and get a point taken away from Daly that backfired when the replay was shown. Josh Koscheck might want to take a look at that and uh, stand up. Between that and the animosity built up between the two, where Daly was unable to do much at all in the fight, became so pissed off that he actually fired off a left hand after the final bell went off. Not only is that obviously illegal, it's assault, and it was enough to get him kicked out of the UFC for life by Dana White. Number two, Charlie Ward versus John. John Redmond. Conor McGregor has now become infamous for creating massive controversy outside of the cage and creating chaos. 
And this was one of those such events that happened back in 2017, the same year of Mayweather McGregor where he was reported to have made over $100 million in that fight. So he was at the height of his fame and popularity. It happened after his teammate Charlie Ward had just won by an apparent TKO over his opponent, John Redmond. As a quick backstory, it should be noted that Conor had a strange rivalry with the fight's referee Mark Goddard going back to his early fights against Goddard's fighters and cage warriors before the UFC and most recently recently at the time being told by Goddard to sit down during an Artem Lobov fight where he was shouting instructions despite not being a part of the corner for the bout. So there was a bit of tension between the two already, and after the TKO, Conor McGregor stormed into the cage to celebrate with his teammate. Mark Goddard attempted to get Conor to leave the cage as we later found out that the fight wasn't actually called off at the time. Conor McGregor, incensed by this, chased and pushed Goddard in the cage while threatening him. Then moments later, Connor tried to re-enter the cage and slapped an official from trying to stop him. To Connor's credit, the official did push him first, but I mean Connor wasn't going to be allowed back in. They needed to keep him out. Either way, the most surprising thing is that Connor didn't face a sanction or punishment at all most likely because it was in Ireland outside of the US where there wasn't a state athletic commission in place, but rather an independent commission for overseas events that promised the punishment but never followed through on it. Number one, Kazushi Sakuraba versus Guy Metzger. This fight perhaps has the largest ramifications of any other on the list. It goes all the way back to the very first Pride Grand Prix event in 2000, and it was without a doubt the biggest tournament in the sports history at the time. It was the opening round and the rules were simple. It would be just one 15 minute round there were no draws, no matter how close the fight was, no extra rounds, because the tournament needed to move on no matter what. Sakuraba was already a huge star from his pro wrestling days and was proving himself to be a force in MMA after defeating Carlos Newton, Vitor Belfort, and Hoyler Gracie before the tournament. So when he fought the former UFC star in Mesger, he was seen as the favorite because Mesger was coming off of a two-fight skid. But to everyone's surprise, Mesger won the fight pretty much everywhere it went, where he stuffed Sakuraba's takedowns and won on the feet. But Pride being the Wild West that it was suddenly changed the rules after the fight, and instead of going along with the agreed upon rules stating that there would be no draws or additional rounds, ruled the fight a draw and determined an additional round was needed. This was clearly to favor the Japanese star who they were seeking to push at the time. Guy Metzger himself was suffering of a broken foot before the bout, but chose to fight anyway, and this enraged who, you guessed it, was his coach at the time, Ken Chan. Rock. He immediately ordered Guy to leave the ring and began protesting Pride's decision to call it a forfeiture for refusing to fight in the impromptu rounds. Shamrock spent several minutes yelling at the officials and trying to reverse the decision that still stands today as a loss for Metzger. The reason this is all such a big deal is that the next round of the tournament put Sakuraba against Hoist Gracie who was undefeated in MMA and was seen as the best fighter in the world at the time except for maybe his older brother Hickson. The fight ended up being Sakuraba's crowning achievement at the time and most led legendary fight as it went without time limits to a 90 minute conclusion where Hoist actually quit in his corner. After this and several other wins against Gracie family members, he went on to be known as the Gracie Killer. And if it wasn't for this BS call by Pride officials trying to get their star over, this legendary fight may have never happened. 